Hi everyone, welcome to Ask the Horse Live. I'm your host, Michelle Anderson, Digital Managing Editor of The Horse. Uh, tonight, we're here to talk about taking care of your horse's teeth. Is your horse up to date on his dental care? Do you want to know more about wolf teeth, dental disease, or behavior issues that might be caused by tooth issues? Uh, then you're in the right place. We're joined tonight by Dr. Lynn Caldwell of Silverton Equine Veterinary Services here in Oregon, uh, who's joined us to answer your questions. Uh, welcome, Dr. Cald Caldwell. Hi, how are you? Hi, I'm great. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, I want to ask you to share with us a little bit about your uh, specialty interest or your interest in dental care for horses and some of your work in that area. Uh, well, I got interested in, in dentistry and just dental care for horses um, in my first year in practice in 1993. Um, a good physical exam is always required before you vaccinate a horse. and. Uh, that's one of the services, of course, that we provide to our clients on a yearly basis. And just looking in the horse's mouths and actually looking with a light, um, there were a lot of things that I was seeing that I didn't have answers for. Um, clearly, every horse is a dental patient, so every horse's mouth that I looked into, uh, it, it just caused me to uh, to want to learn a little bit more about that system and about what I could do to help them. So I'm curious because over my time of having horses, and I've had them since I was a kid, so you know, over 35 years, um, it seems like dental care has changed a lot. Um, what are some of the changes that you've seen during your practice? It's changed a lot. Uh, I graduated from Purdue School of Veterinary Medicine in 1993, and pretty much the standard of care back then was just a couple of floats, in a bucket and uh, you go rasp the horse's teeth without even looking in their mouth at that time and and uh, that was about it you know on a yearly basis and um, there there just wasn't a lot of, of buzz about it there wasn't a lot of talk about it and so when I started out in practice I had these questions that needed to be answered and I searched far and wide and I asked all of my colleagues um, that I could think of that I had access to uh, for answers to some of my questions for the problems that I was seeing in some horses' mouths. On my journey, I uh, ended up um, spending quite a bit of time with some lay people uh, because those were the people that were that were really, uh, you know, making a um, uh, what is it I want to say? They were really going out of their, their way to just really look in horses mouths and do something at the time so they, those were people that I could talk to about what I had seen and what my concerns were um, uh, along the way um, geez it's gone from like I was saying just the two floats in a bucket to motorized instrumentation and the, the motorized instrumentation that started um, probably in the late 80s, early 90s was just the high-speed Dremel tool. Um, additionally, after that, we saw uh, the long stroke, big Makita reciprocating uh, device, which was, you know, it was a reciprocating saw that was modified into um, a, a dental float so that you didn't have to, you know, go back and forth with your arm. Because if you do a fair number of dentals, uh, um, you're going to end up with carpal tunnel syndrome and <laughs> and uh, all sorts of other problems, shoulder problems in particular. Um, so now we have just a great selection of manufacturers and um, uh, different styles of motorized instrumentation. Um, a lot of it has some things have water cooling, some things have uh, vacuum, some things um, uh, are are powered by the um, the uh, high-speed Dremel tools, that kind of thing, or Fordham motorized um, flexible shaft kind of tool. Some people have uh, air-powered instruments. Um, there's also been a lot of um, of uh, air-powered um, dental units for horses that you can use 
to to uh, drill into teeth um, or do air abrasion stuff like that. There's just a a whole new world of of dental instruments out there for a very small market. What is comparatively a small market compared to small animal dentistry and human dentistry? Yeah. I have talked to vets who have said that just the um, the use of LED lights for headlamps have completely changed how they can look into a yeah. horse's mouth. So just even right. the things like that. Right. Back in the early 90s, we were using those little battery-powered pelican lamps uh, that <laughs> that you can get at any you know any sporting sporting supply store. But now I've got um, and I've used for years these Enova lights that have 20,000 lumens in LEDs, uh, and they run on camcorder batteries. They're they're just incredible. Huh. So uh, for our audience who's listening, I want to give them a quick review of our Ask the Horse Live format. Uh, we'll be starting with the questions that everyone submitted uh, during registration. If you have questions you'd like to ask live or you'd like clarification on a response that Dr. Caldwell has given, go ahead and enter it in the chat window uh, on your browser if, if you've joined us uh, via um, uh, the internet. Um, so I want to go ahead and get started. Our first question is Kaylin in Nebraska, and Dr. Caldwell, she wants to know what is the veterinary tech's role in dental procedures at the clinic? Is there any dental care that she, as an owner, can do for her horse at home? So it's actually a two-part question. Right, so let's start with the first question, and that's what is the role of the veterinary dental technician or the veterinary technician in helping me and assisting me in the clinic when I'm doing a comprehensive oral health assessment and treatment. Um, my assistant is my wonderful uh, Lisa and she sets up all of my instrumentation for me. She sets up all of the drugs that I will need. Uh, if there's a surgical procedure or an extended procedure that we're going to do, she anticipates that and she'll, she'll set those things up. She also handles the horse and the handling of the horse is probably the most important thing. Um, some of the procedures that I do require requires um, IV drips. We'll have the horse in stocks and so she'll, she'll be watching the IV drip. She'll uh, manage the flow as needed. Um, if we're doing uh, multiple procedures in one day with multiple horses, of course, she'll clean it in between because we don't want to be transferring any blood or um, infectious material from horse to horse. And, of course, we always want to have um, c clean instrumentation and um, as it doesn't necessarily have to be sterile, but as clean and aseptic as possible. Um, she also helps me with radiographic positioning, uh, holding the plate, um, and many, many times it's nice to have her because she can talk to the owner while I'm concentrating on something else. The second part of that question is, and is there any dental care I can do for my horse at home? And I think the most important thing for horse owners to understand is that horses are designed by nature to eat with their faces on the ground, right? They're grazing animals, so they like to be uh, eating with their face on the ground. That's the most natural position for them to be in. So providing your horse an environment where he can eat in a more, in the most natural way possible is probably the best thing you can do for them. Uh, those horses that graze for hours and hours a day um, and, and are fed the least amount of grain and, um, and dry cured hay, those horses that are kept out on those on pastures like that tend to have the most healthy mouths. We start to see a lot of periodontal disease and more malocclusions forming in horses that are kept stalled. Uh, say down in California, there's a lot of horses that never get out on pasture uh, and spend their lives mostly in the stalls until uh, someone their owner comes and works them for the day or whatever. So those horses tend to be fed hay every single day. Many times they're fed hay in hay feeders, hay bags, um, up in the air, um, situations like that. Uh, lots of grain, those horses are fed. So those horses, like I was saying, do tend to have more uh, malocclusions form, more periodontal disease form, um, 
they just have more issues like that. So I guess what it comes down to is if you can, treat your horse for the most part like a horse. Let them graze as much as possible if you have that environment. Um, otherwise, if you don't have that environment, the best thing that you can do is have your veterinarian check that horse at least once a year for any dental problems. We have a question from Hannah, who is also in Nebraska, and Hannah wants to know what kind of education is needed for someone to pursue equine dentistry as a profession. Well, as a profession, you'd want to become a veterinarian first, and um, equine dentistry is a specialty within the profession. There's the American Veterinary Dental College that just recently formed an equine uh, diplomate specialty. So there's now about, I don't know, 10 or 12 uh, diplomates in, within the American Veterinary Dental College that are specifically equine diplomates. So you would, um, you would pursue a, a admittance into vet school. That's a four-year um, four degree. And then you would uh, find a residency. And there's very few equine dental residencies at this point but that's the place to start is to become a veterinarian first and uh, and find a mentor find an equine veterinarian that is um, is specialized or or limited to equine dentistry and um, spend some time with that person okay. we have a question from our live audience dr. Caldwell it's from Deanne and Deanne wants to know if you can explain the difference between manual floating like you mentioned with the files versus mechanical floating what are some of the differences between those two methods it's really most mostly it's um, within the the person that's utilizing those instruments I mean you can you can actually do a pretty darn good job in a horse's mouth with just manual floats hand floats those hand floats, however, um, utilize carbide blades, so they're very sharp. And, and as I said before, if you are doing any number of equine uh, dental procedures within a day or a week or whatever, this, this is very hard work. It's, it's very physical work. Um, I've already had my rotator cuff rebuilt <laughs> in the last couple of years. Most of the dentists, equine dentists that I know have... Uh, have problems with shoulders, carpal tunnels, stuff like that. So, so when the motorized instrumentation was um, uh, first introduced to the market back in the late 90, mid to late 90s, it was really a, a wonderful thing for someone like myself um, because those kinds of instruments uh, can be used to perform the same kinds of things that a hand float would do, but it's easier um, for the operator. Now, there are some caveats that go with that. The motorized instrumentation can take off a lot of tooth material, you know, all in one sitting. You can heat up a tooth, so you have to be careful not to stay on a tooth very long. You have to be careful not to take off too much. That's a, a huge problem with motorized instrumentation. And you really need to have your horse sedated. Uh, in order to use to be using the motorized instrumentation um, safely, did I answer that fully? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, okay. Our next question is from uh, Lynn in Pennsylvania, and Lynn wants to know about her horse that drops half of his feed when he's eating. She said that she's had him looked at by two different equine dentists and found that, and they've said that nothing is wrong. Do you have any suggestions for this horse that uh, is dropping feed? Well, if, they dro if they're dropping grain, I mean, if you're feeding them grain, that's pretty typical. But, I mean, horses will do that. Some horses are just bigger slobs than others. Um, but I, I don't expect them to keep all of their grain in their mouth. I mean, when they're chewing grain, they have more of a pounding uh, motion to their jaw rather than the long uh, lateral excursive movements that you get when, you, when, you're, when their head is hanging on the on the ground and they're eating uh, soft grass. Um, the lateral excursive movements become shorter as horses are eating more dry cured hay. And then when uh, we start looking at the motion of the stomatic gnathic system in the jaw, um, when they're eating grain, we, we see that the horse is pounding the grain. So 
So that's why you'll end up seeing a lot of malocclusions, but that's also why horses will end up dropping a lot of grain because it's not a normal motion for their jaw to be making. Um, if you've had a couple of experienced equine dentists, and I'm assuming that you're talking about a veterinarian, um, have a look in that horse's mouth and, uh, and they see no functional problems, then I would say that perhaps your horse is just a little bit messy. I hope I'm I hope I'm not insulting you when I say that. <laughs> um, our next question is from Carrie in Ohio, and Carrie um, works at a therapeutic riding center and has a herd of uh, senior horses that work there with her. And she wants to know what they should be looking for in these older horses when it comes to their uh, their dental health. Well, older horses, and, and when we're talking about older horses, we're talking about late teens and probably into mid and late 20s. Um, those horses are going to expire their teeth at a, at a usually around mid-20s, um, depending upon the breed and the use and the, uh, the location where the horse has been during his life, of course. But when a horse starts to expire his teeth in the mid-20s, you'll see um, more quitting behaviors as they run out of enamel. Um, quitting is when a horse sort of balls up hay or, or, um, or green grass and ends up spitting it out. It kind of looks like a cigar when they spit it out um, because they're not able to chew it up adequately because they've literally run out of enamel on their teeth. The other thing that you want to look for in older horses is um, is uh, a smell, a bad smell from their mouth. Older horses do tend to get a lot more periodontal disease than, um, than younger horses. And the periodontal disease uh, is the primary, of course, uh, reason for tooth loss in horses. So as horses become geriatrics, we want to probably change their diet to a little bit softer food, a little shorter fiber lengths. Um, one of my favorite uh, pieces of advice for people with older horses is if they happen to have a chipper shredder sitting around, if you can take your hay and throw it through a chipper shredder, uh, you can decrease the fiber lengths um, that you're feeding to the horse so they doesn't have to work so hard to chew the fiber length into short pieces. Um, uh, also, wetting the hay down to make it softer helps quite a bit. Um, and, and people will um, feed hay pellets also um, wet down to make them a little bit softer. And of course, the senior diets that we have available from many different vendors nowadays, of course, are um, probably one of the reasons that we've got horses living functionally into their 30s. So I, I like the the chipper uh, tip. That's not one I've a heard before. Shredder. Yeah, that, yeah, that's really great. I have never yeah. considered that. Um, but yeah, that 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 would work. Um, while yeah. we're talking while we're talking about these older horses, it's probably a, a good time to segue into uh, EO, EOTRH, um, which we received a, a lot of questions about this. Uh, dental disease. Um, the first one here is from Jane and or it's from Mary Kay in Arlington, Washington. And if you're listening live and this was an area that you were interested in, now would be a great time to start sending in, in any additional questions. But can you please address the disease, the causes, symptoms, treatment, the demographic where where we see this disease? And it's one that maybe people aren't familiar familiar with. Well, apparently a lot more people are familiar with it because there's a lot of questions. Yeah, yeah um, definitely. Yeah, we first, we first started, e okay, well, first let me say that EOTRH, or like my friend Dr. Uh, Olivia James in uh, Australia likes to say, Earth. <laughs> <laughs> it stands for Equine Odontoclastic Tooth Resorption and Hypercementosis. So it's easier to just say EOTRH. A friend of mine, Dr. Bob Gregory from uh, the Seattle area up in Washington, first reported on this in 2006 in, uh, at the first Focus on Dentistry meeting uh, for the AAAP in Indianapolis. 
he reported a case that he found that had um, teeth that were very painful for his patient and they tended to be very big and fat, kind of like plums in the horse's mouth. Um, and some of the other teeth were um, very moth-eaten. So we've been looking at this problem in horses for about um, close to 12, 14 years now, I think. I wrote a paper on it um, and presented that in 2007 before it had a name. Um, basically, what it is is a disease primarily of the anterior dentition, okay, so the incisors and canines. We generally tend to see this disease in older geldings, teenage to older geldings, but mares are also included in this cohort. Uh, it's been said that there's more bay horses represented um, than any other color, but having said that, I've had a, several chestnut mares, so um, I don't know what that, what that means, if anything. But what, what happens is the incisors and the canines, generally starting in the canines, and then as the pr disease progresses, it will progress towards the midline. So it will affect the corner incisors first and then uh, head towards the central incisors. But this rule is not written in stone. I've seen horses that, that um, had different teeth affected, but always, of course, in the incisors and canines. What happens is that these teeth start to be resorbed um, within the bone so that um, uh, they'll become loose and the gingiva will recede and they become very, very painful. You'll frequently see fistulated tracts with pus coming from them and the horse has a difficult time uh, grazing. If you offer the horse a carrot, they may not be able to uh, nip that carrot off. But when I reported on it, um, I reported on what I, I reported on what I had observed, and what I had observed uh, back then is still the same thing that I observe today, and that is that I see three different forms of this disease. Uh, the first form would be the the hypercementosis form, where the cemental layer of the horse's tooth becomes very prolific, and they just really form balls. And if you part your horse's in, uh, lips and you look at his incisors you might see um, just big bumps where the tooth roots should be. That tends to be the least painful form of this disease. Um, the other, the next form would be the highly resorptive form where the teeth radiographically look very moth-eaten, all of them. Um, lots of gingival recession, the teeth can actually break down um, and it's very, very painful. This is the most painful form. And the third form would be just a mixture of the two. Sometimes I'll see um, teeth that look like great big balls of cementum, and they do have resorption in them as well. We have no idea what causes this problem. Uh, if anyone has any ideas, um, please send them on in. Um, it, it does seem to be a highly inflammatory condition. It seems to me to possibly be an immune-mediated kind of disease. I don't know if there's something around the world that we're feeding to horses uh, that is causing this or if it has to do with um, any sort of feed additive. I just don't know. I, I really don't know. Is it a virus? Is I, I don't know. Um, the treatment, however, is the same, and it's to get rid of all the dead, infected, and painful teeth. So I will generally start with the canines, if the canines are the worst affected, and uh, perhaps the corner incisors. And um, in some cases, I'll just go ahead and take out all 12 incisors and all four canine teeth all at the same time. I work very fast. Uh, I do this standing for the most part, although I've had a couple of horses that I had to lay down to do it because they wouldn't tolerate standing for this. Um, and I I do tell people that their horses are going to feel a lot better within about 72 hours, and I haven't been disappointed in this yet. It seems to me that horses are very quiet about um, indicating that they're in pain because they're a prey species, which makes sense. 
-hmm. So when you get rid of these painful teeth, it, they do tend to have a burst of energy, and most people tell me that their horse is acting like a like they're five years younger within a few days after they get over the initial surgical trauma, you know. Um, but they feel a lot better. Now, taking those incisors and canines out many times will lead a horse to um, uh, hang his tongue out. So that's a that's a problem if you're going to be showing them dressage or something. Mm -hmm. Some horses don't. You can take out all those teeth and they don't stick their tongues out, but some do. So... Um, that's a problem for some people, um, but most people just want their horses not to be in pain anymore, and they want them to be healthy. Yeah. So what is the long-term prognosis for those horses that have had their teeth removed because of it? Are they, uh, they, are do, they able to they eat? They do really, really, really well. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, they can. I mean, if you think about it, the stomatic nasic system, that's your mouth, your, your muscles of mastication, um, your teeth. Your, your, the bones, everything. Um, the somatic nasic system has to work, right? You, you have to figure out how to use it because if you can't eat, you die. Mm -hmm. So uh, once it's not in pain, once they're not in pain anymore, they generally do just fine. Of course, they can't nip off grass, but their, their lips are very prehensile, so they can sometimes pull grass um, long, that's long enough with their lips, but they, they do just fine. I mean, you have to feed them knowing that they can't nip off grass, so if they go out to graze, I wouldn't expect for them to be able to maintain the, their body condition with just grazing, unless it was pretty long where they could pull it off with their lips. But um, they, they do tend to do just fine without all those teeth. Okay. So for our horse owners who are listening, I think maybe I got the, uh, the acronym wrong. Um, so can you repeat it for us and then say the name of the disease again because it is a really long one. So I and I have yeah, to say so. So my I had mentioned this to you yesterday that my own horse um, might have this. We haven't confirmed it yet, um, but it's this big, scary-sounding, long uh, name when your vet first <laughs> says it to you. So right. It's so the acronym is E O T R H, which stands for equine odontoclastic, tooth, resorption, and hypercementosis. Okay. So it's easier to call it EOTRH. Okay. So if uh, anyone's listening has some follow-up questions, um, go ahead and send those in uh, on that subject. In the meantime, we'll jump into some of these other live questions. We have a question from Erica, and she said that her horse has a small gap between two incisors that causes no problems aside from hay and grass getting packed into the small space. Uh, what's the best way to remove these packed in foods and how often should she do that? So we don't dental floss our horse's teeth, but it sounds like this horse <laughs> maybe could use that. Right. <laughs> right. I mean, you can probably take um, a tweezers or a little hook and try not to hook their, their live living gingiva. They would probably not like that too much and just sort of pull it out. Um, the other thing that you can do and and uh, what I will do with people that have horses whose teeth I've removed is I'll have them flush the horse's mouth out periodically either with warm salt water or with a dilute solution of chlorhexidine. Of course you want to take out that hay from that, that uh, place where it's packing because Whenever they pack food in any spot, whether it's between the incisors or the the canine t or the um, the cheek teeth, they're going to end up with some periodontal disease. So, whenever I'm doing a comprehensive oral health assessment and treatment on a horse, and I see incisors with uh, widened interproximal spaces, which are the spaces between the teeth, um, and and they if they're packing food in there, I will I will take um, kind of a sickle hook and pull that that feed out and uh, see if there's any inflammation going on in there. It's it's not the easiest thing to do uh, because again we don't we don't use dental floss in horses but a little sickle hook is the easiest thing and I suppose you could always try um, a short little firm um, toothbrush. But, uh, but no dental floss and no horse braces. <laughs> Well, horse braces, we can talk about that at another time. <laughs> and yeah, no dental floss. Okay. 
Um, we have a question from Kathleen in our live audience, and she wants to know if horses have the same uh, concerns with plaque on their teeth that, that we have with humans or even small animals. Okay, so the question is concerning plaque, which is mm -hmm. dental calculus or tartar. And in, in uh, small animals and people, that's a huge problem because that is directly going to change the flora within your uh, the gingival sulcus around your teeth and will lead to periodontal disease. So that's the primary cause of periodontal disease in people. Uh, calculus is not the primary cause of periodontal disease in horses, but uh, periodontal disease is, is in horses is primarily caused by teeth that are out of alignment, um, teeth that are not tightly held together uh, so that we have um, spaces in between the teeth. Uh, you will see feed packing at that in those spaces um, and then you'll have the, the uh, bacterial flora change and we'll end up with periodontal disease. Now when you get the periodontal disease going in the horse's mouth then you start to see more calculus. So when I, when I open up a horse's mouth if, or if I'm working in a horse's mouth and I see an area that has in particular um, some calculus on it, I make sure to take that calculus off so that I can see what's going on underneath it. Sometimes I'll, if I see this on a canine tooth, for instance, I'll take the calculus off and sometimes I'll find that I've got a pulp granuloma from a, from, um, a resorptive lesion in a canine tooth. Uh, many times I'll see them on the buccal surfaces of the maxillary cheek teeth. Uh, many times that will be caused by um, some periodontal pockets in between the first and second cheek tooth. Uh, so anytime you have a bacterial flora change, it's going to bathe the, the local area and you're going to end up uh, accumulating this calculus, this tartar. We have an, another question from our live audience. Uh, Karen is concerned about sugar in our horse's diet. Uh, we know that sugar is not good for human teeth. She wants to know if you feel that sweet feeds that contain molasses could increase the incidences of periodontal disease in horses. I, I, my concern with molasses in feed is, of course, for metabolic syndrome in horses. And horses just like people do better with low carbohydrate diets in general but but um, as far as the um, the dental health of a horse goes I don't think molasses is terrible for them I, I just don't like it in a feed format for horses at all I try to discourage my clients from feeding their horses like those little pinwheel candies those little sugary candies the reason that we don't that that dentist human dentists don't want you to eat a lot of sugary feeds is because if you pack that between your teeth it increases the chances of cavities and dental caries in people not necessarily so much in horses okay so um, my primary concern with sugary feeds is for equine metabolic syndrome um, and second and secondly would be um, would be their dentition we have a question from our live audience. Ellen says she has uh, four horses ranging in age from 8 to 17. How often should they have their teeth checked and floated by her vet? Uh, definitely a comprehensive oral health assessment should be done every year by your veterinarian. That doesn't necessarily mean that anything's going to happen, that they need to be floated. And certainly the older a horse gets, uh, the less eruptive potential that they have on their teeth and uh, uh, the less you'll need to intervene until you end up in the geriatric stage and then we tend to be uh, getting into a horse's mouth more often because geriatric horses have more problems with sharp points and periodontal disease and losing teeth of course but for middle-aged horses like you're talking about at least have them looked at once a year and, and I mean a good looking at. A good examination many times requires sedation and a speculum and a bright headlamp and just getting in there and looking. Um, I think many times people want a veterinarian to just kind of look in the mouth um, and, and, and take a quick peek and tell them what needs to be done but 
there are so many things that can be going on in that horse's mouth that you're not going to recognize just on a brief little quick peek like that. Um, so during your yearly vaccination appointment, um, if you, particularly if you have a horse that's got some bad breath or, or is having a bidding issue or um, a chewing issue or something like that, then you might want to have your veterinarian perform a complete exam where the, the horse is sedated, uh, a speculum is placed, and a headlamp is put on. And, and uh, like I said, there may not be any, um, any changes that need to be made at that time, but at least you've had a good examination done. You mentioned earlier about making a horse's eating situation as natural as possible um, for their dental health. We have a question from Amy in Tennessee, and she wants to know how often do pastured horses need their teeth checked? Uh, she said that her horses get a little bit of uh, concentrate feed, but mostly they graze. What are your recommendations? Well, I still think you need to have them checked once a year, even if it's a rinse out the mouth and um, have a good look with a bright headlamp, at least have a look. Um, but as I said before, those horses that are out grazing 24-7, 365, those horses tend to have the best mouths, um, the least amount of problems. Um, but if they are getting a bit of grain, you know, you've, you've got some uh, potential for problems there. But at least have your your veterinarian look in the horse's mouth, whether it's a brief exam or a more comprehensive exam, once a year. We have a question from Laurieanne in BC, Canada, and she says that she's heard that using a slow feeder hay net can damage or cause irregular wear in a horse's mouth. Can you confirm this? Uh, yes, and, and I think that the problem lies in the fact that you're hanging a, a hay net and so the horse has his head in an unnatural position as he's taking the hay out of the hay net. Um, the slow feeders that are on the market nowadays uh, tend to be, they're plastic I believe and they've got some sort of a grate at the top. You put the hay underneath the grate and the horse has to has to pick the hay out um, through the grate. Now those grates can cause problems if the horses are um, are biting at the grates to get to the hay. Um, I would think that you'd have less of a problem with those nylon hay nets. Um, uh, so I think the biggest problem is with the new type of slow feeder that has the metal grate in it. Okay. And what kind of damage are you seeing on their teeth when they are using slow feeders? When they're using slow feeders like that with the metal grates, you'll see abrasions on the teeth, similar to the kind of abrasions that you'd see in a horse who rakes his teeth along the bars. If they, if you've got, say, um, uh, what do you call that? Those um, metal bars in their stalls. The, some horses will rake their teeth on the metal bars, some horses will rake their teeth along the, the brick walls or the wood walls or whatever, but the teeth will suffer some abrasion and loss of tooth substance. Um, I don't think you're going to see too many fractures that with the slow feeders, but that possibility does exist depending upon how frustrated your horse gets, I suppose. Uh, and along those lines, Kimberly in Pennsylvania wants to know what's the best way to handle a horse that has what appears to be a broken tooth? Depends entirely on which tooth is broken. Okay. Uh, if you are looking at an incisor that was just broken today, call your veterinarian right away. Um, if, it, if the fracture of that tooth has gone into the pulp horn, then you've got an exposed nerve there and it's very painful. It'll become infected. Uh, horses have an incredible ability, however, to heal their teeth. But if you give that horse the opportunity um, by, by performing a vital pulp cap in a case where a pulp, you've got a, a pulp exposed and you can get to it within the first 24 to 48 hours, uh, you can you can save that tooth from dying back. Um, the, those teeth will generally die back to about um, the, the top, the coronal uh, two-thirds of the tooth will die. And um, 
and the only part of the tooth that will be vital will be the distal or the apical one-third of the tooth. So we would like that tooth to be vital um, as high up and as long as possible. Dead teeth are brittle and break more. Um, and uh, if you've got a if you've got an exposed pulp like that, you can end up with a great big infected pit, you know, in a horse's in the horse's tooth, and it's painful. If it's a molar, you might not even know it. This has the fractured tooth until your horse starts giving you problems on the bit or problem eating or something like that. Um, if you have a fractured cheek tooth, you may also see a swelling of the maxilla or a swelling of the mandible. Um, some of those teeth will need to be extracted. Um, we don't do a lot of root canals in horses, although we've tried that over the past 10 years. Horse teeth, again, heal so incredibly well. Don't do great with endodontics uh, at all. Um, but the possibility exists. Depends on the tooth, depends on your veterinarian, depends on the experience of the dentist in, uh, involved. So you mentioned those horses that run their teeth up and down the stall bars. <laughs> Um, mm -hmm. yes, yes. And, yeah, and I think that everyone who's been in a barn with those bars has had at least one horse that does that. <laughs> um, but yes. uh, a similar issue are horses that crib um, when it comes to having damaged teeth. Uh, Jennifer in California sent in a question, and she wants to know about her mare that cribs. She said her, her front teeth are barely there anymore. Are, are there any major problems that could occur or is there any way to help this mare who cribs and has worn down her, her teeth? Yeah, cribbing is an extremely frustrating stereotypy in horses and I think um, probably the worst part is the headache that it gives you. But um, many, many horses crib and many, many horses crib off the entire crown, clinical crown of their uh, incisors. The worst thing that can happen with that is a pulp exposure. I've seen a few of those um, where the the whole tooth, you know, becomes abscessed and has to be removed. But generally, that's not the case because the um, uh, the tooth has had a slow chance to um, to heal itself. But if they get it down, if they get the teeth completely worn down to the gum line. Many times there's nothing you can do to save them. But most horses do just fine with them. And, and that, that begs the question, well, if they don't have any maxillary incisors, then their cheek teeth are in um, full occlusion all the time. So does that tend to hurt them? No. They, they gradually adapt to that over time. And again, we're talking about the stomatognathic system here. It's a very adaptable system. Uh, cribbing horses tend to do just fine, other than the damage that they cause to your stalls and to your nerves. Mm -hmm. um, but similar to parrot mouth horses, parrot mouth horses uh, with absolutely no incisor or occlusion uh, tend to do very well as well. Um, but the cribbing, I think, is the most annoying thing about it. Uh, you've mentioned the possibility of root canals. We have a question from Lisa in uh, Michigan. And Lisa said that she's heard of horses getting fillings put in for cavities. Is this a necessary procedure? And when is it uh, recommended for horses? It, we started doing composite restorations of decayed infundibula. The infundibula is an enamel cup uh, in the incisors and the maxillary cheek teeth. Um, I've done a few of them. However, I think it, I abandoned that procedure a long time ago. It's There are still some people that want to do it, but um, I really feel that it's primarily an unnecessary thing. Um, the infundibula in the in the maxillary cheek teeth of a horse, when they are when there's a defect in them, I don't even know that you can call it a defect. It's been shown that some of these infundibula can be shaped like mushrooms, and you wouldn't know it. So if you are going to fill that, you would actually have to 
debride the entire mushroom shaped cavity and apply a bonding resin and insert your uh, composite restorative material and then either light cure it or self cure it and it's just not something that's practical for horses and in my opinion not really necessary. We have a question from Mary in our live audience and she wants to know if horses that use grazing muzzles are more at risk for de developing EOTRH or any other dental issues. So EOTRH, um, no, grazing muzzles definitely not a cause of EOTRH in horses, um, although <laughs> I'll have to put that on the list because what the heck, we might as well consider everything, but no, uh, grazing muzzles are not going to cause EOTRH. No. Is anyone looking into a genetic tie to it? And you mentioned earlier that maybe bay horses have it more uh, than other horses. Is it is it being researched anywhere that, that you know of? Yes, we continue to research it. Uh, we continue to send in teeth that we extract um, for histopathology and um, we try to gather as much data as we can about where the horses are located, what kind of diets that they're on. Um, many of the horses up in Canada that are seen with it are seen uh, live close to the coast. Um, uh, but it's seen all over the world, actually. So, you know, we're just going to try to continue to gather as much information as we can. Hopefully, someone can come up with a reason for it. Okay. Uh, Deborah is in our live audience, and she wants to know if you recommend x rays on a yearly basis for horses that are over a certain age. Could that possibly help detect uh, EOTRH sooner in horses? Yes, it could. Yearly. Yearly radiographs would be a nice thing. I mean, we get yearly radiographs when we go to see our own dentists. Mm -hmm. And our small animals, uh, when when they're brought in for their dental cleanings, get a full set of dental radiographs. I suggested years ago that horses would be um, well served to get a full set of dental radiographs on a yearly basis because we could find these problems before they become a real issue, a real clinical issue. Um, but I don't think that there's any one age for a horse to, to um, you know, need more dental radiographs. But I think that the exam is the most important thing. You want to have a good, comprehensive exam done by someone uh, with experience with dentistry, uh, someone who knows what to look for, and um, and can point you in the right direction and and set up a treatment plan for your individual horse. Uh, we have another question from Deborah from our live audience, and she wants to know if there's a specific age that horses will start to lose their molars. She has a 26-year-old horse who had all of his incisors removed, um, and now she's worried about his molars not sticking around. Well, he's 26, and we can't make them six, you know. So the, the mid-20s is about the time when the cheek teeth in a horse start to expire. We were just talking about those infundibula in the maxillary cheek teeth of horses, so um, that's a that's a good way to look at the age of a horse. The number nine tooth is the first molar, so it's right in the middle of the cheek tooth arcade. Uh, the the there's two infundibula in those maxillary cheek teeth. There's one in the front, so that's the mesial infundibulum, and there's one in the back, the distal infundibulum. The mesial infundibulum will expire or go through all of its enamel in uh, the first, you know, 22, when the horse is 22, 23. Uh, the distal infundibulum will then expire after the mesial infundibulum, so then when that one is expired, we know the horse is, uh, you know, over 25, 26. There's nothing that we can really do. Uh, we don't have dentures yet uh, for horses, um, but uh, I think the question was, what can she do to to um, to keep the the teeth in his mouth long as long as possible. Am I correct with that? And also just how to deal with uh, him aging and and the possibility of of losing his molars after already having lost his incisors. Oh right, yeah. Well, he is a geriatric horse now, and you can expect that his teeth are are becoming expired. So you know we'll 
flip over to the geriatric feeding program, which is softer feed, shorter fiber lengths, um, uh, and a periodic rinsing of the mouth is probably a good thing too because these older horses do tend to get a lot of periodontal disease. So a good rinse to try to get some of the uh, the uh, feed that they that they may be packing between their teeth removed um, every few days is is a good is a good habit to get in as well. Okay. We have a question from our live audience. Uh, Gabrielle wants to know if a horse has had an upper molar removed, what problems could the opposing lower molar cause, and how soon after the top tooth was extracted would you start seeing those problems? You'll see, you'll start to see a super eruption of the unopposed tooth immediately. Now, it's going to depend whether that horse is a younger horse or an older horse, because the eruptive potential. Uh, diminishes as the horse ages, as they uh, suffer clinical uh, uh, attrition of their teeth just due to age. As a horse, when the horse is young, it has a very, very long reserve crown. Okay, when the horse is older, it has a very short reserve crown because it's those teeth have suffered the attrition, you know, just from eating. So if the horse is younger it's going to have a, a much greater eruptive potential and um, your veterinarian may want to get in that horse's mouth within six months uh, to take down that overgrowth that's going to occur because it's that tooth is unopposed. When the horse is older, it's going to take a little bit longer for that to, to happen. So, um, you know, but still on a yearly basis, you want to get in there and make sure that it's not causing any functional uh, difficulties. We have a question from our live audience from Phil in Texas and Phil has a two-year-old stallion and two of his front teeth seem undergrown compared to Phil's other young fillies. Is there possibly a problem with this colt or is he simply just still growing his teeth? Okay, how old is this colt? Two years old. He's two years old. And he's got two, is it his two front teeth that are that are shorter? Is that what he's asking? Uh, yeah, two front teeth that seem undergrown compared to his other horses. If he's two, if that colt is two and a half years old, he might be looking at uh, permanent teeth that are erupting into the mouth. He might have already lost his caps, and you're going to see these, you know, brand new teeth erupting down that that are going to look pretty short. Uh, the two front teeth in a horse shed, the baby teeth shed at two and a half years. The lateral incisors shed at three and a half years, and the corner incisors shed at four and a half years of age. So two and a half, three and a half, and four and a half years of age. They lose their baby teeth incisors. That's probably what he's talking about, but I don't have a crystal ball. Okay. So do horses tend to lose their teeth pretty much by the book or are some horses a little bit different in in that timeline? Well there's always going to be variations. Um, the the exfoliative schedule as I just went over for the incisors are two and a half, three and a half, and four and a half. I've noticed that you know you could be off by uh, a couple of months but it, they're generally pretty right on. Uh, donkeys though tend to be a little bit later. Um, a horse will have its full set of adult teeth by the time it's five. Uh, so everything starts erupting, um, I'm sorry, everything starts exfoliating or shedding at two and a half years of age and it should be finished by five years of age. The last teeth that come in are the third molars or the number 11 teeth and the canine teeth in male horses. Those come in between uh, four and five years of age. So with young horses, uh, like I had one young horse that I never noticed that he was 
losing his teeth and, and his uh, permanent ones were coming in. And then I had a filly who tends to be a little bit sensitive about everything and she went off her feet and, you know, I looked in her mouth and it just like, it looked like a horror show. You know, all her teeth had come out <laughs> and she, her gums were red and bloody and she was so sad and it was so hard to get her to eat. And then, um, and, and we gave her, um, some NSAIDs, talked to my vet, and, and we did some stuff just to make her more comfortable. But do horses just tend to deal with uh, shedding their teeth differently? Uh, you, yes, it entirely depends on the horse. It depends on their use. Like you said, you had a filly that was very sensitive and sad when her when she was uh, losing her baby teeth, and, I, and I've seen that in some animals. Um, the problems that I've seen, though, with um, eruption and exfoliation generally are when the canines are erupting in a male horse, there's no deciduous or really robust deciduous precursor, so there's no baby tooth um, that is sort of leading the way for that permanent tooth to come into the mouth. So, so those canine teeth have to sort of bust through the bone all by themselves, and that can be very painful. Um, and that happens between, you know, three and a half, four and a half, five, something like that. Um, I will recommend to my clients to use some Anbasol if they're going to put a bridle or a bit in that horse's mouth when he's erupting those canine teeth. Um, the other teeth that we generally see some problems with when they are um, erupting are the fourth premolars in a horse. Those are the number eight teeth. Uh, the number eight teeth um, come in at about um, oh three years and eight months, something like that, close to four years of age. But they come in between the uh, number seven tooth and the number nine tooth, of course. The number nine tooth is the first molar, which erupts at one year of age. The number seven tooth is the third premolar that erupts at two years and ten months approximately. So it's been there for a year by the time the, that the number eight tooth comes in. So by the time the number eight tooth is ready to come in, it's got to fight its way through a tighter eruption pathway than the other teeth in that arcade. And um, you may tend to see uh, sometimes these big painful bumps on their jaw or up on their maxilla. They look like they get a kind of a blocky head going on. Typically in mini horses, we'll see that. And um, some of those baby doll face quarter horses um, and Arabians can have those problems, but generally that's a bigger problem in um, mini horses. We have uh, a follow-up question from our live audience. Chrissy wants to know when you say expire, do you mean that, that the tooth is going to fall out or that the tooth just no longer functions as it used to? The tooth is no longer functioning like it used to uh, when it had a full complement of enamel within the clinical crown. So when I talk about a tooth expiring, if you're thinking about a cheek tooth, uh, particularly a maxillary cheek tooth, say, that it has about three different layers of enamel in there. It's got the outer enamel layer, it's got a couple of inner enamel lakes, and it's got those two inner uh, infundibula that are like cups of enamel. Uh, I, I previously talked about the schedule for those infundibula to expire. So you, you can think about that tooth as sort of becoming cupped out. Um, it becomes cupped because there's no more enamel within that uh, um, the the body of the tooth. So there may be enamel on the outside, that external uh, enamel layer is intact on the outside, but there's no more enamel on the inner layer, so all you have is dentin. Um, and the tooth will look cupped if you look at it in the mouth. Um, and those teeth do tend to get very sharp enamel points. Um, uh, so, you, you know, those teeth clearly can't chew up fiber in any way, shape, or form like they could when they were younger. Uh, dentin is a much softer calcified material of the tooth. The enamel, of course, is the hardest uh, uh, tissue that we have in our body. And without that enamel, you can't, you can't chew your fiber up very well. 
And we have one last uh, follow-up question from our audience that we'll get to before we need to wrap up, and it's from Kathleen. And she wants to know uh, how a horse owner can rinse out a horse's mouth. What recommendations do you have on the method of that for the average horse owner? The average horse owner, most everybody has a hose, right? Um, some people will We don't all have get, horses that uh, like us sticking hoses in their mouths. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so <laughs> some horses like that. Um, some horses uh, don't mind it if you take like a uh, a small soft piece of hose and you and you um, you screw that onto the end of your of your hose. You can put the soft hose into his mouth so he can chew on it without you know the metal fitting on the end of it. You know what I mean? Okay. Cut the metal fitting yeah. off. Yeah, and just send that up their cheeks and you know, do it with a slow stream of water so that you don't gag them with a bunch of water and maybe you can train them to that. Um, when I have uh, a horse with a problem, I carry on my truck and I dispense to my clients these um, 500 milliliter nylon dose syringes and they have a brass nozzle at the end um, with kind of a ball on it so that, you're, so, so that it's kind of smoother, you know, you're not poking them. If I have a particular reason that I want someone to flush out a certain area of a horse's mouth, I'll have them uh, use these nylon drench syringes and um, pull up um, a little bit of dilute chlorhexidine or, or salt water or something like that and, and um, insert that little brass nozzle up in their horse's cheek and, and rinse them out that way. Okay, well, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for tonight. Um, I want to thank Dr. Caldwell for joining us. Thank you. And I want to let everyone know that uh, we've compiled a, a list of resources. So if you were listening and we uh, didn't get to a question that you had, uh, we have pulled together uh, an article. It's at thehorse.com slash 33424. So that's 33424. I looked that up and there's 10 of our favorite resources on uh, equine dental care. For everyone who listened tonight and submitted questions, we also want to thank you, and we hope you can join us next month when we're discussing equine herpes virus. Until then, from all of us at The Horse, we hope you have a great night.